Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final episode of the Late Bloomer Actor Podcast for Season 2, 2023. I ended Season 1 with a um, special episode where I brought back three guests from the year, and it, it was very different to many podcasts that I've listened to and a, and a great success, so here we are again. I would really like to focus on the two biggest issues coming out of the acting world this year, or at the very least, the, the second half of the year, that being the actor strike in the US um, and the, uh, the intrusions, for want of a better word, of artificial intelligence or AI into the acting world or really into the creative world, not to mention the rest of the world and all areas of our daily lives. I feel my guests will have some great insights into these issues, so let's just jump straight in. I'd like to welcome back firstly from season one, Episode four, Mr. Greg Apps. Welcome, Greg, and thank you for coming back for this special episode. Pleasure, David. It's great to see you. And secondly, episode one of season two, uh, Mr. Jeff Seymour, a.k.a. the real-life actor. Uh, It's great to see you too, Jeff. How are you? Oh, I'm great. Thank you. Nice to be here. I was just saying before we hit record, it's uh, so fantastic to have um, what I consider two of my... um, uh, mentors on the screen at the same time so this is uh, wonderful and um, I just must say that uh, everything that I've taken from my acting journey in the last couple of years since meeting both of you um, has been fantastic and it's, uh, it's changed the way I I act and approach the business so thank you very much for everything that you've given me over the last few years. I'm glad and you got something out of it. Thank you yeah. very much and we will be having um, a, a third guest on. She'll be coming in probably in about 25 minutes, hopefully, um, from our very last episode. So she's fresh off the boat, as I say. Uh, Dr. Tiffany Lindell knight uh, Tiffany will be logging in shortly, as I said. So we'll um, introduce her when she comes in. So, gentlemen, uh, just quickly before I throw my questions out to you, uh, can you give the listeners of the world a quick reminder of your current role in the industry, your background, and, and what is one thing that you have taken away from uh, 2023, whether that's uh, good or bad. Uh, uh, Greg, you want to go first, mate? Um, so my background is, is I started as an actor and then I moved into casting. I've been casting since 82. Um, and I've cast sort of, you know, a lot of major films and stuff like that. Uh, I mean, you know, I was, I was lucky enough to be the cast, one of the, the, the Australian casting director on Mission Impossible 2. But I think, I think sort of, you know, um, being a casting director on Mission Impossible 2 is akin to being the stuntman on Muppets. It's kind of like <laughs> it's not really a kind of a key contr- contributor, um, you know, because it's about the stunts and it's about so long as Tom Cruise is getting to do his jump off cliffs and things like that. Um, but sort of, you know, more recently, sort of when the self-taping age started, I was sort of right at the coalface with regards to um, because, you know, I was the one receiving all the self-tapes. So um, it was a natural for me to sort of move into training, online training, online training of people of sort of, you know, to, because the thing is, and the kind of the fundamental thing I want everybody to understand is, is that when you go into the studio, when you go into the studio, you walk into the casting director's creative space. Mm. When you stand, when you stand in front of your self tape camera, that's your creative space. As long as you take, as long as you take that creative ownership. Um, so that's what I, I like to say that we empower actors. Um, but that's awesome. me. And then sort of, you know, what was the last bit? That, one, one thing so to take out from that you took away from 2023, whether that's good or bad. Uh, the kind of, yes, the kind of, you know, the, 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 the technological change, the kind of, you know, which came to a head with the strike, both for writers and actors, because to a certain extent, I think writers are going to be more impacted than, than actors with this AI mm. thing. Uh, and where that will lead and to sort of start the discussion because un- until we start that discussion, until we start that discussion, not, let's face it, the streamers aren't going to sort of start the discussion. They're very happy to leave it as the status quo. Certainly, certainly. Awesome. Thank you very much. And it's all, like with your um, self-taping, you that was pre-COVID. So everyone had to go through COVID, but you saw the writing on the wall, so to speak, and brought it in way earlier and, and, and started giving actors training in that area. So that's fantastic. Thank you very much, Greg. And, and Jeff, um, quickly for yourself, mate. Yeah, I uh, started acting in 1979 on television here in the States. And then in 1980, I started teaching. So I've been a teacher and an actor uh, all of these years. Um, what, what what did I, 2023, what did I get? Well, uh, how fragile, you know, an actor's life is, 
if they really count on, if they're really counting on, you know, making money, the fact a strike could happen and then just kind of take everything out and put them in harm's way is, uh, is pretty perilous for many of these people. I mean, mm. luckily I have my, 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 uh, side hustle as being a teacher. So I've always managed to get on, even though, you know, I did a lot less, uh, private coachings for uh, auditions, obviously, but you know, Luckily, there are a lot of ambitious actors out there that still want to keep the training up for when the strike breaks. Um, That's fantastic. Yeah, it's yeah. A, it's an interesting world we live in now, isn't it? It is, and this whole AI thing—it's it's 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 interesting. I the more that I'm aware of it, the more I realize every time I'm watching something on social media and someone is narrating, I'm realizing that's an AI voice now, and I realize it because they mispronounce words that a human would never mispronounce mm. in the way it's being used in a sentence. That's how I can tell the, um, the way that they say a particular word isn't the way you'd say it in that moment. And then I realized, oh, that's a computer doing that right there. Otherwise a human would know in this particular instance, you would pronounce that word, which might be spelled the same way differently. And I start catching it all the time now. All these voices that I keep hearing that I think are humans speaking to me with all sorts of different accents and male, female, young, old. I'm realizing, well, most of that is AI, but it gives itself up in this, uh, the way they mispronounce things. So you see it there all the time. And um, I mean, I've been thinking about this AI stuff. I, I, I realized that Obviously, the ones that are going to be hit the worst are the background performers. I say that only because technology at this point seems that, yeah, they're not really going to be able to. I mean, we've seen this thing recently with Harrison Ford in his latest Indiana Jones, where they made him look young. Mm. And uh, with Robert De Niro and whatnot, where an AI could take and then model all their past looks and work it out. But you know, today still, you, you know, you, you have to kind of squint your eyes a bit to totally believe it. But there it is. And I'm, I'm assuming it's just going to get better. I don't think that that is going to be the thing that's going to take over and they're just going to decide they can do that. I think there'll be something for that home cooking of a way an actor in real life is acting. But background, that's where most of these people that make their money boy, they're really going to be in harm's way because, you know, people just walking by in the background or sitting in the stands or, you know, being in a restaurant, well, they're fuzzy anyway when you see them. So the chances of them being replicated will be far easier. And there are people, as we all know, we have friends, I'm sure acquaintances who make their entire livelihood by being background performers. Next, so. Certainly certainly in America, I've heard that. Um, uh, Greg, were you going to uh, comment on that just before? I was just going to ask Jeff if he thought, you know, he said those glitches in pronunciation, whether he thinks ultimately they will be ironed out and will we be able, in the future, will we be I'm able sure. to tell the difference between AI and yeah, real Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, just like we learned from the Terminator movies, you know, the thing will keep training itself to be able to get the tense of a word better. And, and certainly, you know, we used AI. I did a play recently and um, uh, called Seminar by Teresa Rebeck. And we were supposed to read, we we're supposed to have in our possession <clears throat> stories written in different genres. This guy had a story about that. She had a story about this. And I said to one of the people putting it together, I said, you know what, can we just have something there? I mean, I know I'm going to say my lines anyway, and I can make it all up, but wouldn't it be nice to actually have some written stuff? So I know my character wrote something from the, it was like, uh, he said, what a great, piece of writing, it feels very 19th century. And so I read the piece that this guy was able to just go and dial up really quickly. It was amazing how accurately it set the time, the tone, the people, how they lived, and then a certain kind of expressive quality that you would attribute to a writer perhaps of that time. But having said that, um, it wasn't perfect. You know, I mean, it, it felt a little verbose. It, it didn't have the quality I felt of a human writer, but it certainly was fascinating. I mean, it blew me away at how you could just kind of put in genre 
type in a few details and it would instantly spit out like a six page story yeah. with characters and names. And I mean, it was, you know, brilliantly quick. But as Greg said, I'm sure they can probably polish it up. I wouldn't necessarily have gone out and bought this story, but boy, oh boy, it was shocking at how quickly it could spit something like that out and really make it feel like of the time. I think the scary yeah. thing um, also is that the amount of data that the computer can process. So you can take, we could take Stephen King's books and feed them all into an artificial intelligence generator and then say, write the next Stephen King book. You know, based on the, its ability to absorb everything from those books, so his writing style, his character styles, his, the story, the way he writes his stories, it could yeah. write a book that you might then read as Stephen King and go, hey, Stephen King's put out this great book. It's fantastic. That's what's really, really scary. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's funny, you know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, if we put this scene we're having right now in a movie, it would feel like a scene in a movie. Mm. where we're talking about AI and how, you know, I mean, it's just, it's absurd how this is actually happening because it really I mean, does. Some of my favorite feel. movies. There's some of my yeah. favorite movies <laughs> where AI is in robots. So um, right. Jeff, have you done, uh, so Greg, have you, you've been involved in any of those, those type of movies that have predicted what we're now living? Oh, well, you know, how many movies have predicted yeah. what we're doing, you know? <laughs> I mean, you know, back That's with 2001, which was made in what, 80? No, before 84, when, whenever it was made, 2001, yeah. where Hal takes over. Mm. And, you know, you, you turn to Hal and say, Hal, I'll take, I'll take back control now. And he said, no, you won't. <laughs> um, because it's like, but why? Because Hal's saying, because I can do a better job than you. And that's really, yeah. that's really the territory that it's in. It's, it's interesting. I've, um, I'm working with Alex Proyas again on his next film, and he did iRobot. And iRobot, of course, was that there was one rogue, one rogue robot that actually started to think for himself. And then he was able, a bit like kind of, you know, a union leader or kind of, you know, whatever, sort of start to gen generate the kind of the support of all the other kind of, you know, mindless robots. Um, you know, it's kind of, you know, we, 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 so therefore, iRobot was prescient in terms of sort of, you know, what's, what's happening in the future as well. Mm. So, so bringing that back to the casting process, how do you think the introduction of AI might change the way you work, how casting directors approach, approach auditions and talent selection, for example? Uh, what qualities do you think actors should emphasize to stand out in this, like a, this landscape if it changes and goes down this path? I did an exercise. Bad? I did an exercise and I asked for the top 10 actors Australian actors that could play a detective, okay, in their 40s. And it ended up with all the usual suspects. It had Nicole Kidman, Kate Blanchett, um, um, Naomi Watts, Rose Byrne, you know, male and female, mm -hmm. uh, Joel Edgerton, Hugh Jackman. So I changed it and said, give me all the actors that are kind of Australian in their 40s that could play a university professor. Same names. Mm. Same names. The point I'm making is, they are the people. They are the people that have a profile. If if AI's job is to trawl the internet, obviously Roseburn, Nicole Kidman, etc., etc., Kate Blanchett have far more coverage, profile on the on the internet. So as far as that is concerned, it's about you know as Jeff's absolutely right in saying it's background actors because now they are just a kind of you know. Um, um, a wipe a body that goes through, you know, you don't mm. need that. So, but where I think what it's going to change is it's going to change the filmmaker thinking because suddenly they're going to go, how do I make this work for myself? And they're going to start with the script and they're going to say, they'll ask AI, but there you go. There's an exercise to do for everybody to do. Give me a film that I can shoot entirely on AI, write the script, write the story. Mm. And it'll, it'll change the way. And I hope, what I'm hoping is that it actually will, it's almost like it'll be a new art form, a new genre. So sort of we still retain the kind of the essence of human human input in terms of script and kind of performance and, and character in films, but sort of, you know, that there will be this kind of parallel, parallel kind of, you know, creative art of this is an AI product. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, in the short term, 
there'll be there'll be posters that say entirely AI. But then let's hope back in, in about five years' time it says entirely done by humans. <laughs> yeah, I love it. That, that's what I'm think it's, it's like the difference between you know fast food and farm to table. I'm Perfect. hoping that real actors will be like farm to table. It'll be a thing where it's like it's done totally with real live actors, written scripts by real people, you know, and, and there'll be something to it. Like you're getting organic food, you know, and uh, and then there will be I'm sure there could be shows with lots of action and robots and things that an A.I. could conjure and it would probably make a certain audience very happy. There'll be lots of explosions and crazy things your eyes can't even imagine you're seeing. But I, I'd like to believe that forever and ever, there will be a, a desire, a wanting for human made stuff, you know, with all of its <laughs> foibles. Mm. Uh, that that's I, I think I think just like anything I mean we like for organic we like farm to table I'm thinking that'll keep yeah. us there but the background the background performers let's face it that that that's a tough one you know because it costs a lot I of think course. that if they are going to do a thing where they say look we're just going to photograph you and now we have your image now you know it hit the bricks uh, th that of course is to me insane i mean i i feel like that just that can't happen you've got to the person if you keep using that image has got to get something even if it's a few pennies you've got to get something definitely Otherwise, definitely it's i mean the end of the day they the computers are that good they don't need to scan us in if they want a thousand people in a stadium scene they'll just make a thousand people but if they want to try and um maintain that that human quality so to speak and be using their background as actual humans and certainly hey we want to scan you in. We're going to, but every time we use you, you will earn a hundred dollars or a point oh oh one percent of the budget or something like that. Some sort of residual payment, which we'll start talking about later when Tiffany's here. But a residual payment, so that every time they use your image, yeah. that you get paid. And well, the that's... other thing there is, the biggest thing is that, hey. I might be fine with my background image being used for whatever, and um, I mean, obviously, I'd be concerned if they used it in certain ways. But um, I expect that in a couple of years' time, I'm going to be a A-list actor. So all of a sudden, I don't want them using my background uh, image uh, uh, in a sex scene with monkeys or some something stupid like that. You know what I mean? So yeah, exactly. Mm. So um, that's uh, it's really interesting. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, you know, one of the things I saw that they're a uh, little up in arms about the actors is the amount, and, and I did a podcast on this. I, I didn't know if we were going to talk about it, but the amount of material that you get for a self-tape now and then wanting to limit that amount of material so that they don't give you five scenes that you're supposed to put on tape. Um, and, and I have a lot to say about that because you know, certainly Greg would, would know all about this, but the biggest reason I think this is, well, I know this is happening is because in the old days, when you came into a room uh, to audition, well, no casting director would give you five scenes because if you were lousy, two sentences into the first scene, no one wants to sit there and watch five. We know we're not going to use you. It's done. It's over. And it, you know, as easy as it may seem for the casting director, albeit perhaps a crusty one, to just say, all right, that's enough. Get out of here. Yeah, no one wants to do that. I've sat in a lot of rooms and we have just put up with some bad stuff. And it takes everything when they've asked for the, like, can I try it for a third time to say, no. You know, we, we don't want that yeah. kind of bad juju in the room. We don't want that energy. We don't want people to feel bad. That's why we look at them and we say, thank you very much. It was very nice. We just try and grease them out of the room. You know, nobody wants to tell you how they really felt because it's easier to say, great job. Thank you. Bye-bye. And you're out of the room. and We don't have to put up with this sad storm of an actor leaving the room all broken. <laughs> Once you're in a room... Uh, you know, any cast ranger, I know when I was casting live for my TV show or my theater, it would be like, you know, a couple pages. Because the fact is, you know, in a couple, you know, as soon as they walk in the room, more or less, and then they start talking and you got a great idea. But with self-tape, I think what's happened, and I think it's primarily perhaps it's just 
I don't know, maybe being a little lazy on the producer's part, when it comes down to deciding a scene, and certainly Greg knows more about this than anyone, but I know from my experience, you try and find that scene that's going to really let me know whether you can play that part. There's a quality in the script. There's a certain scene. And I know for myself, having been the guy in charge, I'd think, okay, I need to know if they can do this scene and maybe this scene, you know, but maybe one is good. But there is, there's going to be a crux thing. It might be emotional. It might be where you're supposed to be, whatever that quality is. And let's say it's in spades in that scene. So I want to see that scene. Well, you know, you have to think about it. You have to sit down. You have to read the script. You know, you're casting people, the producer. Okay, uh, well, since you're going to do it, you're not going to come into my office and I don't have to, you know, stop you from doing five scenes. Uh, I can just say, uh, yeah, let's give them all five. Let's give them all five. What's it to me? <laughs> Here's what it is to me. I'll watch half the first scene. If I don't like it, I hit delete. I'm done. You might have spent two days memorizing all this stuff, three and a half hours taping it, and I'm just going to look at it and go, oh, no, he's a redhead. Boop. That's it. Done. I'm not going to sit and watch all five scenes. If I don't like you, I'm going to watch. I'm just, you know, you're going to look at their face and go, oh, I don't think so. And then I'm going to start talking. Let's say they're not that good. Bam, I delete. Well, this is great mm. for the producer. It's great. I don't have to do anything. And I don't have to sit in a room and sit and watch five scenes, which I would never do. I mean, one of the tricks a casting person does, maybe Greg has done this, I've done it, where the person's doing, you have two scenes, maybe you have three, and they go through the first one, and then they go, oh, we're not actually doing the second one. I'm sorry, did, you, did your agent not give you that? No, yeah, we were not. Yeah. So you just try and get yourself out of it because it's, it's a waste of time for everyone. And we're always, you know... <laughs> behind the eight ball trying to get through the casting process. So, but now you can just say, give, mm. yeah, let me do the whole script. Just give them the whole script. Said, you know, take, take the whole damn thing, you know? And that's just, cause I coach these mm. people. And I'll tell you what I've told them. I've said, there's five scenes. I say, pick your two favorite, and put those on tape, forget the other three. And here's why, cause I've been a producer. If I watch you and I like you and there's a, and, and I see only two, I'm not going to suddenly go, oh, God, this guy's perfect. But you know what? He didn't do the other three. Forget it. I'm more than likely going to go, hey, where are the other three? And then I'll say, call the agent, find out what's going on. And you know what? We'll sort it out. Now, if you got all the time in the world and you're a great, you memorize great, you want to do nothing but put five, yeah, do it. But most of the actors I deal with, they're like got a family, they got a job, they go, oh my God, I got to get these five scenes. I say, pick two out. Trust me, if they like you, they're going to they're gonna say, I, what, where are the other ones? What happened? They're not going to go, oh man, he's perfect, but he didn't do what we said. I've never known that to be the case. Maybe Fair Red enough. will straighten me out here. That, um, but that, that's, that's how I've done it. Does that resonate with you, Greg? I was, I was going to ask, um, it, it, and it's along that same line for self-tapes, that um, self-tapes has given casting directors the ability to see a lot more people because they, it, it's faster to just be able to sit down and watch videos. But do you envisage a, a bit along the lines of what Jeff was saying there of AI actually taking a bit of that out of your hand and watching the videos for you and then just spitting out the, the good ones that meet your criteria? Oh my God. No. No, AI is no. never going to no. judge. AI is never going to judge the kind of the, the work of somebody. Interestingly enough, I, re I saw, a, I saw a, um, an article about a, a, an art competition that was done um, earlier this year, about three months ago, and the person who was judged as having the best art then went back and said, I'm sorry, I can't accept this award because it was an AI-created piece. Was that the beach, the photo of the ocean waves coming in? Something like saw, that. Yeah, yeah, I saw that, and the photo it about was that too, beautiful. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. so therefore... Thank you. A creative person has said, fess up time. I, I didn't do that. But it shows you that sort of, you know, there's a piece of work created by AI, judged by humans, that they say, that was great work. Mm. Um, and sure, he would have doctored it and done the same kind of Photoshop kind of approach technique thinking that sort of, you know, photographers take with their work. But it shows that sort of it can go through. But just to sort of, you know, touch on Jeff's points, you know, that is the thing, and that's that's what the Casting Guild of Australia has just sort of recommended, and it's certainly happening happening kind of, you know, globally, for, and, and starting from the top down, from the top casting directors down, is first first audition is two pages, you know, three tops. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Second yes. audition, 
second audition might be a second scene. What I also sort of have <coughs> have a lot of kind of, you know, angst with is producers saying, you know, I've got to see that big emotional, I've got to see them break down when their son dies. And I'm saying, not for the first audition. No. Not for the first audition. It's not a, it's not a test of how good they are. It's a test of what qualities they're going to bring to the character. So let's do the scene where they sort of, you know, where they meet the girl for the first time because that's where the character wins and we all, the audience is on their side. We like them in that scene. Now we'll work on the kind of, you know, now we'll go to the next stage and take them, as Jeff said, with the script and sort of they, they've, got more, they've got more information about what's, what has to be done. But there has to be limits. There has to be yeah. limits for exactly what Jeff says because it is. It's, it is. It's like, you know, we don't. I, it, I, it, I, yeah, I have an analogy. Still... I have ahead, an please. analogy which is you're sitting in the theatre and an actor comes out and stands front centre stage and delivers a scene, leaves, the, leaves the, the, the stage, we all applaud. Another actor comes out, stands in exactly the same spot and delivers exactly the same scene and that goes on for the entire 90-minute performance that you sit there. At what <laughs> stage do you go, oh, we've seen better than this. Do we, can we, yeah, how do we... How do we get rid of this guy off stage? Um, you know, right. and, and that's that's it in a nutshell because that's what a casting director's doing. But I've I've got this all powerful tool which is called a mouse. Click next, next. Yeah, fair enough. No, I, I to... love the. Sorry, go on, Jeff. I, I know when I would be audition, I would try and have an audition. That first one, as Greg said, absolutely a couple of pages. You know. I used to have students um, sit in in my theater auditions and I'd say, you know, as the day went on, I'd say, when did you know I wasn't going to use that person or that person was wrong? It got to the point where they'd say kind of when they walked in and not because of their attitude or anything, but it became clear what we were looking for. And now are you ever, is, does it ever go the other way? Does somebody walk in and I say no? And then I go, well, it's rare. It happens but usually you kind of know what you want. So, you know, it could be something as crazy as, you know, we've already got three redheads or that girl doesn't look like his wife, looks like his sister, or you know, just the dumbest thing in the world can preclude you from using an actor. And so you can't use them. So on a tape, if I see it, ah, too bad, let's save it, let's move on. Well, we've just had some technical um, difficulties there, but we're back and we're back with um, Dr. Tiffany Lindell Knights is in the room. Um, welcome, Tiffany. Hello. Hi. How are you all? Hello. Fine. Now, have Thank you me. met um, or had any involvement? We've got uh, Mr. Greg Apps, casting director out of Sydney, and Jeff Seymour, uh, the real life actor out of the LA. I, uh, I think I've auditioned for Greg once or twice. And Jeff, I actually believe I sat in on one of your classes in Vancouver uh, in the late 90s, probably. So, wow. yeah. Really? yeah. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> that was like the first time that I went up to, uh, when I started teaching in Vancouver was in 1999. So that okay. you would have been at the first time I went up there, yeah. I think wow. I was. I think I was. Wow. There you go. Definitely well, you look food. just the same. You haven't aged a day. <laughs> oh, well, even the same with you. <laughs> oh, thank you. You know, uh, just to finish what I was saying, that if I was going really quick, I tried to see one person every five minutes because I'd see a lot of people from my theater, you know. Mm. And so you'd only see 12 in an hour. And that's if you were really going that's going cool. the machine was perfect and you'd bring them in hello how are you you'd have a little exchange please after you and without feeling rushed i found i could do about one every five minutes with a nice short scene <laughs> well if you've got self-tapes now if you could they could go through 12 and 10 minutes easily i could just no 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 i mean unless they were great then i'd sit and watch them but that's why i i'm sure and i'm sure greg would back this up live auditions are just, they're never going to come back. I mean, they might for a, uh, if you have a recall, uh, you know, you want to meet the person, absolutely. But the idea of renting a space and paying these people to sit behind a desk and then you have a filmer and a reader and a, all this added cost and all these crazy actors running around wondering where the bathroom is, is there any water, you know, doing yoga, downward dog in the middle of the floor. I mean, no one's going to want to go through that anymore. And that's the thing that we lost with COVID that I, I do not believe will ever come back. There's no need mm. for it. You know, why would you do I, it? 
Yeah. Tiffany, as a heads up, we've, we're just coming. We've been talking about AI essentially. So um, and now that you're here, I'll, I'll, we'll go back in a sh in a sec and start talking about the actor strike and and the financial side of things. But uh, from your point of uh, perspective, as the national vice president of the Australian Union, the MEAA, uh, you're you have unique insights into the uh, union actions. How do you think actors' unions can adapt to the challenges posed by AI and other technological advancements while still advocating for the rights of actors? So that sort of led us in. We were talking about how the rules have changed for um, self-taping and minimum of two pages. And I asked Greg just before you came on whether he thought AI would ever take over assessing self-tapes, and Greg was yeah. adamant that that would never happen. So what's your views on that from a union perspective? Gee, that's an interesting perspective of, um, of AI assessing self tapes. I agree. I don't think that that would be. I hope that's not possible. Um, mm. this, the Australian Union actually, uh, well, of course, we, as we said in our uh, previous uh, meeting, David, uh, the Australian Union stands in solidarity with SAG AFTRA, and uh, we're very grateful to the actions they're taking because uh, they, you know, where America steps, the rest follow. Um, but we do have some distinctions. The Australian um, agreements, film and television agreements, actually specify that you can't use somebody's image outside of that particular contract without permission. So we're really grateful for that. And I wonder if that, you know, that sort of protection is a result of just a general Australian awareness that we have to protect our, it's like we have to protect our flora and fauna. We have to protect our, our artists. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm not sure where it's going to go. I heard an interesting, I read an interesting article not long ago, um, suggesting that, um, the industry will change in a way that we have, um, a more diffuse, uh, industry. So we have smaller studios, um, located in different regional areas and you actually have like an ensemble that work full time as actors making less money than the. The, the celebrities, but on a regular, you know, on a regular wage and this ensemble then um, basically work as well, well, they can use skins to 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 embody all sorts of different ages and ethnicities and character types. And uh, this in this article is a medium article was, you know, thinking this was going to be a great thing because it's going to mean that the, the it provides more actors um, a working uh, living on a you know, sort of a nine to five basis. And, you know, I suppose there's, you know, there's an argument for that, but it feels pretty idealistic to me, to be honest. Mm. And I still think we need to, um, we need to be promoting all diversities to actually have the work. Uh, it's pretty cynical to have, you know, a small group of people who then just wear the mask. So. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. Mm. Interesting. It's, it's, I, I, it's, and one of the things, one of the things that um, just to sort of pick up on that whole thing of sort of, you know, whether AI will judge, judge auditions, I think, you know, for, for me, there is a kind of, um, and this, this comes down to sort of all the people, it's grown and grown and grown. I, I did a film called Romper Stomper many, many, many years ago and proof. And what I did was is the producer, the director and myself and my assistant sat in a room and we chose the actors. And that was it. The mm. filmmaker chose who the characters were. These days, there's casting by committee. These days, it's kind of, you know, and it's, it's, you know, I call it casting the poster, you know, because you're casting the names that sit on the poster and there's so many people and, and the, the people that are making those decisions, lost, they're not filmmakers, they're there. deal makers. Greg. And they're the ones, and that's what I think the essence of the kind of the strike has got to be all about, which is it's the kind of the creative people who all sort of want, want the status quo of sort of, you know, creativity of not just the performer, but the person who is in judgment of that. But it's the, the deal makers who want to go, no, 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 we can make a buck here. We can, we can kind of, you know, we can sort of, you know, find a way to do this cheaper, cheaper, you know, where that's their priority. And that's the kind of, you know, what has to be regulated, um, even if it's something that has to be sort of, you know, at government level. Mm. So that sort of brings everything into perspective about what the SAG-AFTRA is um, fighting for in the US. And I, I, I believe they may have gone back into the room was the last advice I've heard. What's everyone's views on where they see us needing to be um, in a worldwide context, but also in the US being the biggest market? What, what do we need to see? What big changes do we need to see so actors can actually feed themselves? I think that's the biggest issue. Oh, 
I think the essence of the the strike or the kind of the essence, and, and it's been happening for a while, but it's kind of you know it's death by a thousand cuts. Um, it's like with the streamers. Whereas in the past, and certainly in the Australian award as well, sort of, you know, you were you were bought out for sort of, you know, one screening plus four repeats, and it was how mm. many times you were seen. But the kind of the deal with streamers and what's, and streamers have taken over, with streamers it's kind of something can be seen again and again and again and again and again. And there isn't a reflection. So in effect, the actors are being bought out for that streamer. And that's the kind of the issue. And... As I say, the big companies are starting to get used to that. They kind of quite like that deal. So mm. therefore, and that's the kind of, you know, the issue that's at, that's at stake here. And yes, not before time is it is it kind of, you know, now front and centre. But this is from a layman who I'm not, I'm not privy to the kind of the day-to-day -day of the strike, but that's where I'm seeing it from where I sit. Mm. Tiffany, what's your perspectives there? I think we talked about it a little bit um, about to the millions and millions of people that are subscribing to all these streaming networks at $16 a month. So um, whereas actors before in the old days, they would be paid residuals every time it was shown on NBC or another network because they were getting advertising. But now they, they're not getting anything. So if the TV show crashes and burns... I've got no problems with actors not receiving any money, but if you're streaming a show and there's millions of people watching it and the streaming companies are taking $16.95 a month from each person, then surely there, there needs to be a way to remunerate those actors because of their show is making the success and bringing in more people who are becoming more subscribers. I, I, I mean, I guess, I mean, I echo Greg, I don't know the nuances of all the, the industrial models or the, the economic models, but it, I'm, I, there has to be a sort of a change in the way we quantify what's being seen. Netflix does not disclose, if I, as I understand it, what their biggest hits are or how many things are actually being viewed. So I don't know, if, and I don't really know how they're able to get away with that or what the regulatory model is that we can't indicate that. I, mm. you know, I, I think it's interesting that A24 has, um, has acceded to all the requests. So, you know, actors are still working for A24. So, and that's a, that's a huge industry. And I think that it shows that um, there, there are ways forward um, it, with newer, hungrier industries. So maybe what we'll be seeing is new studios breaking through this and uh, and being, you know, more conciliatory and a little bit less greedy. Um, mm. But I think that ultimately it's, um, it's about having to look at how you, we have to look at how we quantify success in a different way. Uh, if Netflix Certainly. is not going to reflect. Excellent question. Excellent. Because mm. mm. the money's I, I there. Think getting, I, I think getting something is, is important. Did, didn't we just see that Suits, what was it like? A billion hours it was some ridiculous amount of time people had been streaming suits and none of those people were getting any money for it including me because i did a i didn't even think about that till right now but yes i i did a suit um uh, i think you need to get something i mean obviously if these people are making something something is something i mean i still get residuals from the jeffersons from 1981 or something you know I did a homeland in, in 2013 and every so often, you know, I get a check for something. I mean, I can take myself out to dinner or someplace nice. It's, I have friends that work so much, <laughs> they live on their residuals. And it seems fair. I mean, I, we were part of it. We made it together because of my performance along with everyone else's good hard work. You know, people watch it. Yeah, I get it with streaming. I get it. You know, maybe that percentage is, is less. But, you know, even when I receive, well, I've got one right here for $9.15 from something. <laughs> and you know what? I, I appreciate the effort. I appreciate the fact it makes me feel like, all right, then, you know, you're, you're paying attention and you, you're still, you know, breaking me off a piece. And I, 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 yeah, the streaming thing, that definitely has to be worked out. That just doesn't seem fair that you could, because somebody's making a ton of money. And it's not For like sure. when you do, it's not like when I did Suits, they said, hey, here's, a, you know, an extra bonus amount. And we're just going to have it forever. All right. You don't get anything. I mean, in Canada, that's what they do. You know, they pay you a buyout. You get 
uh, your daily rate plus 115, 130%, so $1,000, so maybe plus $1,300, and then theoretically, that's it. You're done by buy. But even there, I believe after five years or six years, if it's still running, they then have to get into a residual program with you. So, I mean, same. it's just what, yeah, it's what's fair is fair. So let's just figure that out. Otherwise, yeah, because come on, just like you said, if it's 1695, but times, you know, 200 million, uh, that adds up. You could live mm. on that. And, and the, the, the producers are, sorry, go on, Tiffany. No, you're right, Tiffany. Just another, you know, another aspect to it is that with the preponderance of streaming services now, there is so much content being pumped out there, which is, you know, great in, in theory, but we're also noticing that people are being overworked, you know, crews are being overworked, that um, we're seeing a lot of non, non-union non shows being produced, and that's where we're starting to see dangerous say, practices happening. So I, I think as, a, as an entire model, you know, and this is a result maybe of COVID as well, we all were just so desperate to have content, and so everyone sort of jumped on the streaming bandwagon, but I think there is going to be something of a reckoning where we're just, we're over glutted right now with content, and, and it needs to be sort of looked at as a, at a holistic level about, mm. um, you know, the training involved and the safety practices involved, and we're spreading ourselves too thin, maybe. Mm. Greg, do you see that on your casting side of more expectations from producers? More, they want more from you for less and more from their actors, et cetera, et cetera? There's a, there's a kind of, you know, the hierarchy. I mentioned Romba Stomper where the four, the four creative people attached to, attached to the casting made the decision, decision made. But these days there's so much, there's so many suits um, there's so many suits involved, it's from the top down. And suddenly, you know, you're getting you're getting producers coming to me and sort of, you know, we, we could have Kate Blanchett in the lead, but suddenly they come to us and say, do you reckon we can get Hugh Jackman? And it's like, mm-hmm. we don't need Hugh Jackman. He's not right for the part. There's somebody better for him. Do you know what I mean? There's this pressure from the top. It's this kind of top down kind of, you know, pressure of we need more and and, and let's get more because of the kind of the pressures that are on its kind of, you know, um, um, uh, film markets where sort of, you know, because these da- and what are, what are these sales agents doing? They're saying, OK, I've got Kate Blanchett and Hugh Jackman. They can now sell that film with a poster. They'll go to their art department and say, dummy up a poster and they'll send that to the distributors and they'll sell the film and sort of abrogate their risk, their entire risk with a, in a morning with a few emails. Mm. And it's that thinking, and it is, it's to do with the greed, the corporate world. Sorry, I'm going to digress now, but it's sort of, you know, I had this theory that it goes back to the kind of, you know, the Margaret Thatcher kind of Ronald Reagan era where they said it's top-down economics, it's trickle-down economics. That'll never work. Well, it'll never work for us. <laughs> it works for if you're at the, t- at the top trickling down, but it's kind of like you put more money in the pocket of the, of the, of the kind of the, um, of the suits, they're not going to share it. Mm. And that's the kind of that's the kind of thinking. So, and I don't, I don't know how to police that. I don't know how to do mm. that. It's it's kind of you know because they're the ones that sign the checks. So, then that's got the gold makes the rules. Yeah, it's interesting. And we talk about um, fairness, don't we, uh, in finances and money and stuff like that. And it just the people with all the money and the people that make all the profits, they certainly don't want to make it fair because that takes more of their profits away. So. Well, they too are answerable. They're answerable to the shareholders. Mm. And that's the kind of the justification of everything Qantas and Alan Joyce has done is, well, the shareholders are happy. It's like, exactly. not the customers. Not now. <laughs> not now. No. no, because the customers aren't. That's right. That's right. And the customers in our industry won't be happy if there's no, no content being made. Well, I guess they'll mm. be happy with reality television for a little while. But, you know, I guess that is where the change is happening. That is why it is exciting mm. to see this industrial action happening. And uh, mm. that is the way you push back. So so it's an exciting it's a, time. It's an exciting it time. It is, it is. And it is. if, it, if Look, it comes out with the right answers, it'll be great. So. Well, on the flip side, it's all the time. I mean, I, I know I started in 79. I think there was a, a strike in 1980 and in 86. And then this one. I mean, there have been commercial actor strikes and other mm. strikes, but I mean, pure actor, I think it was 80, 86, and now 2023. That's, that's a long time for us 
to ask for more money to go in between. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I remember I I just started and a crazy thing was my, (laughs) I was a young buck. And uh, I remember my agents came to me in 1980. I just started, I just started to work and then it stopped. And they actually said to me, would you be willing to do a Playgirl spread? For 2000 bucks. Yeah, I get asked that all the time. (laughs) I said, no, I don't think so. But thanks for asking. <laughs> it could have been yeah. a career changer right there, Jeff. Yeah. 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 Who knows where you would have been now. I think yeah. there is that kind of what streamers has done and sort of you mentioned there's been no strike action for sort of, you know, possibly you know, 30, 40 years. And it's perhaps because what's happened with the streamers is there's, there's more quantity. And so sort of, you know, we've, we've all been lulled into a false sense of security because we're all doing well because there's lots of work. Um, we're fighting the, you know, with the Casting Guild of Australia, we fight for sort of, you know, this kind of minimum because it's really easy to push fees down, um, you know, because there's somebody will go, I'll do it cheaper, I'll do it cheaper. Oh, mm-hmm. And, you know, so it's kind of, we've got to maintain the quality and we've got to, and because of the quantity, as I say, there's so much being made that it's really easy to be lulled into a false sense of security and say, I'm doing okay, but in reality, Actors are not making any more money than they did back then. Mm. No, and everything costs more. And, uh, you know, you look at whatever fee you get, and after you take everything out of it, I mean, you pay your rent and you have a eat a steak and it's gone. I mean, it's uh, to make a living in the industry without the money going up a bit. And, and they're asking for more, certainly, but it's, it's not an egregious amount. It seems fair what they're asking for. It's Do you guys that think that um, this... This financial um, uh, pressure on actors around the world now, does it would that be having an effect on their artistic um, creativity? Um, you know, they're taking on multiple jobs of working outside of the industry um, in between roles. And then when they are getting the roles, they're, they're financially worse off because they they've obviously can't do their, their secondary employment. So do you see or do you feel that this would have a, an impact on actors' creativity and, and then force coming back to AI, then have the, um, the streamers and that justifying more so, oh, that's why we're using AI? I don't know. I mean, I was, you know, it's interesting hearing Jeff's perspective about the industry and, you know, based in the States. And I, it was a great shock to me to come from Vancouver where I was working in film and television, you know, fair amount, and to, to Australia and re- realise that, you know, the income here is is it's minuscule compared to what I was offered a series regular, you know, and it was a television series. And um, I brought I brought it back to my agent in Vancouver and I said, this is this is what they're offering. She's like, that's all right for a weekly rate. And I was like, no, no, no. That's for the whole season. <laughs> it's, <laughs> in, it's entirely different because the market is so small compared yes. to North America. Yes. So oh, we all. Listen. Yeah, we all have, we I'm... all have to. We all have to have another job, like really, like the vast majority. And, you know, in Vancouver, it was still felt like, oh, you got to have a Joe job. Well, you're not really making it. But here, everyone does. And I think that the other things that I do um, enrich me as a, as a person and, and enrich my uh, understanding of the human condition to bring back to my art. Like, that's what I, how I justify it anyway. But mm. that's the reality. You know what? Well, I did, uh, I I was a series lead in a one-hour show in Toronto, and uh, it went really well. And in the first season, I got uh, the best, uh, you know, dramatic actor, what they give you, their their form of an Emmy. And I remember going to my uh, agent and saying, well, look, I mean, you know, the show's still going. I mean, how much money could we get? I mean... If if they all if people came into the streets and started yelling my name and everybody went crazy, how much is the most money we could get? And he gave me the most ridiculously low figure. And I said, well, what? He said, well, look, there's 300 million people in America. That's the advertising dollar. There's 30 million total in Canada. There are more people in the state of California than there are in all of Canada. One tenth the advertising dollar, one tenth the income. It's it's it that there is no money. That's just how it mm-hmm. is. So 
America is certainly an anomaly because we now have 335 million people or whatever it is. So yeah, you can get a little more. And I totally understand why Australia and why, why Canada can't. But you can't really make a living, you know, like a big living, unless you become a movie star and you start working for American producers. Otherwise, you can make a decent living. I mean, it's okay, you know, but it'd be just like having a job anywhere else. When it comes you know. to the creative arts, though, really, that's that's the kind of the way it is. I think. I think there's a kind of a, um, you know, the top half of the top two or three percent, be it art, be it composing, be it kind of you know whatever, they make really really good money. And then there's probably another lot that make a good living, but the vast majority don't. Um, one thing I want to say, because then I'll just touch on what David said, um, and it talked about uh, time and having other jobs. I was um, I was working with Rachel Ward on a series, and, I, and she said, I, I gave her the list of names in the afternoon, and she said, I think we need to come back. I think we need to go a little bit older. Can we have a look at a little bit older? And I said, okay, I'll get you a list by the morning. And she said, no, I don't want it in the morning. I want it in two days time. I want you to think about it. I want you to, to do your job, to be creative. Um, and that's another issue that's sort of touching on the kind of the um, self-taping is, so the point I would make is actors need to, even if they have another job, what they need to do is they need to commit to the creative. So often I think sort of actors, when they approach self-taping, they think the key is to get the to get the lines down and to do the lines and to do a kind of an error free test rather than give it some thought where can i take this where can i take ownership and that's the creative spirit that's the kind of the territory it's really easy you know no it's not really easy i beg your pardon um but for a writer to write something from a whole a hallmark sort of program a kind of a you know uh, um you know a family kind of drama or something like that it's i, I would think it was Easy, um, but sort of, you know, to write something that's really kind of, you know, got depth of character and and dimension and all that kind of stuff. Some of the great stuff we see coming out of Europe, dare I say, you know, mm. it's um, it takes time. Mm. Mm. I when I was back in Vancouver recently, I had a friend who's doing loads and loads of self testing, and he said he's noticing that with younger actors come in, he's had directors say to him, "Geez, they give." such an immaculate self-test but then they come to set you know and they can't take direction because they can't shift because they're they're polishing something but they haven't had that opportunity to be in the room is that something that you've come by in feedback from directors yourself um i haven't had it with feedback i mean to a certain extent it's casting to type isn't it it's kind of you know that the actor type is sort of what they put on camera and you get to know, you know, it's it's like, so for the bigger roles, series, you know, series regulars, series kind of, you know, well, that kind of thing, that's where you do another test. And, I mean, often I will go to the director and say, can we can we get them to put down that scene because, and just ask them to do something different? And it's more so, and it's not so much to test the actor. Well, it's more so that the director now is on set informed and right. knows the, I'll call it the limitations of the actor, um, the limitations of the actor and sort of what they can give. Because, I mean, to a certain extent, it's casting to type. You know, when yeah. I did Chopper, there's a lot of real there's a lot of real criminals in Chopper. <laughs> they haven't got a range, but as far as creating that community, mm. you can't beat it. It's kind of like, you know, it is that yeah. community and that's that. there's dirt under their fingernails. Yeah, yeah. I, I have something to say about that, actually. I, I, I'm on a crusade about the very thing you're talking about. Uh, and it's part of my training, and it comes from the fact that, you know, I also act, and my observations of having been a director and been on sets is the actor's superpower is their ability to take direction. I don't care what you brought to the set. It doesn't matter to me at all. This is what I tell people all the time. I mean, maybe you'll bring it to set and we won't say a word and it's exactly what we want, but that's not very often. I find the biggest hang up is the actor's inability to change. And I draw an analogy with dancers. I say, you gotta be like a dancer. I'm gonna give you new choreography in a five, six, seven, eight. I'm gonna show it to you once like a director asking you to do it. And now you need to do it. Mm -hmm. Most actors can't change. And it happens because they're, it's usually an insecurity. They're, they're, they're thinking, everyone's looking at them and the yeah. thing they brought to set now, 
uh, no one, uh, uh, you know, that no one likes what they're doing. So now they feel under the gun. So then they end up taking what they did and then they just try and alter it slightly. You know, they try and get louder with it or something. And I say to them, look, take that and throw that in the bin. Forget it. It doesn't matter. You are a superhero on a set. If you can take direction immediately. And I mean, 180, you do the exact opposite thing. I, I got a job once uh, in some show and it was a big, nice part. And the guy who was reading was a friend of mine. And they had all the A uh, Canadian actors in for this role. He told me I was the only one who changed when the guy said change. I blew wow. my mind. I thought you got the best actors in Canada coming in here. And that's because people are so afraid rather than don't worry about it. On any set I've ever been, if the, uh, the, all the cast, you know, the cast, the crew sitting around, if you have an actor, I don't care what you bring in, but then the director says, hey, do this for me. And then you do it. Oh, you're like a hero. Everybody loves you, man. They don't care what you, we can't even remember what you brought in. It doesn't matter. One of the <laughs> things I tell uh, actors all the time is um, I say, never ever worry about anything that's going on other than listening to what's being told you and do it. And, and so in my class, I always say 50% is acting theory and 50% is you taking direction from me. That's it. So whether I give you direction that's good or bad, it doesn't matter. Because in this dojo, the exercise is do what I say right now. Show me what that's like. And you're going to build a muscle that actors need to build. And that, to me, is the weakest muscle the actor has, is their ability, like a dancer, to take this new choreography and do it right now. And if you can do that, boy, you're always going to be a hero on a set. And that, that is a problem. So speaking to what Greg just said and what you just said, uh, absolutely. Well, speaking to what Tiffany just said, that, that skill is hidden in a self-tape. That's right. That's right. Because I, uh, I teach now too a bit, Jeff. I've learned <laughs> And uh -huh. that's exactly what I, I, I work with as well, is like give yourself permission to release that choice that you, you know, you honed that choice and you love that moment. Mm. And then when we say do it differently, they'll just, they'll, they'll still hold that moment. You go, no, no, no. Each moment's got to be fresh. Try again, try again, try again. Mm. And if and it's you, amazing. As a young actor, if you yeah. don't get the opportunity to flex that muscle in an audition room, it's very hard to then move to those moments where you get to be the recurring part, the series lead, if you haven't had that yeah. chance to have that flexibility on and that, set. And that, a real director, yeah. Yeah, and that it, makes it the same, bring it back to self-tapes because we don't, we're not in the room anymore and we can't have that redirection. So I, I deliver something on my self-tapes and I, I, I find I'm not the most creative person, but I take direction really well. So if I was in the room with an audition and I delivered it the way I wanted to see it and then Greg turned around and said, no, I want to see more anger here or, or he's more emotional, I can switch on the dime, I, I believe, and deliver it. But the problem with self-tapes is you don't get that opportunity. You get the, to send one or two takes and if you don't cut it, you don't get the chance for Greg to turn around and say, well, oh, I think you've got it, is... do it this way. No. Listen, this is survival of the fittest. Oh, you know, yeah. Actors say this to me all the time. And I say, well, well that, that's what it is. Everybody, ha it's a level playing field. You're all going to take your opportunity of to do what you think. And that's it. So you don't get to redirect, but nobody gets to redirect. So you just use your best ability right. to do exactly. it. That's it. Do you like to get a couple of versions, Greg, when people are selling, sending in self-tests? Or do you, is it too, you don't have time, do you just need the one? I did ask on the, on the most recent film I've just done, I asked for two takes of Great. each scene and, sort of, and make it different. Great. Specifically Good to, to make it different. And so, you know, so if, and if you've only got two pages, you can ask for multiple takes. Yeah. You know, yeah, but you it's can. when you've got a Imagine 11 pages and saying, and give me two versions of each scene. <laughs> I, just because I'm an old curmudgeon, I don't ask for two takes, I'd never do it. i give you one. That's it. I just say, that's my take. That's my idea. And I know, I know that might limit me, but that's how it is. I just go, no, nope, that's all right. I, this is what I think. If you like it, you'll hire me. If not, because I find if I have an idea about something, Unless they specifically say, hey, I'd like to see one with, you know, really this and then the other one with really that, then, then I'll do it. But I, I don't like to sit around and think, well, how can I do this differently? I, I just, well, I just don't do it. Fair That's enough. me because I'm old and I'm, yeah. I'm a dinosaur. I know you. Yeah. 
they know your reputation. It's Jeff Seymour, but for young actors, <laughs> we need to be able to know what right. they say. Jeff Seymour. Mm. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Uh, uh, Jeff, you just said it there when I was saying how I, I'm not in the room anymore, but uh, well, that's the way it is. And this brings it all the way back to where we've been talking about AI and the, and the changes in the strike and where the acting industry is going is that we need to not complain about where, the, where it's going. We need to ride with it and learn how do I use this change in a positive way for myself? What do I need to learn as an actor or as a casting director or as a teacher to address these claims and make it work for me. Is that is that a good way to look yes, at it? Yes, of course. Mm. This is survival of the fittest now. You know, when somebody says, boy, mm. this is a really hard scene, I go, yeah, well, it's hard for everyone. So, so you know, Deal good. This is, these mm. dialogues are really hard. I go, well, it's really hard for everyone. So you're going to be the one that's going to show us how to make this stuff pick up off the page and fly. You've got to make the difference. So now it's up to us. Nobody said it was easy. I and mean, when you get in this business, it's like you're treated like royalty. It shouldn't be easy. It's like going and buying one lot of ticket. You know, when you go, hey, what happened? I didn't win. I mean, it, it's supposed to be hard. It's, it's, it's the craziest industry in the world. And when you get to work, it's like, God, it's crazy how wonderful it is. Yeah. So it's going to be hard. And accept that it's going to be incredibly difficult. And you're going to be the one that wins the Iron Man, you know, the Capilon or whatever the hell it is. That's just how it. it has to be. That's the attitude you have to have. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank I, you. Go on. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, I hope that, I, I mean, I hope that AI, being based in South Australia, I, I hope that self-testing, in theory, is an opportunity for people who aren't based on the East Coast to be seen. I think that's still a long way coming. To be mm. honest, I, I know it's hard for production companies to go, yep, yeah, we want to see you now and expect someone to fly right in. But in theory, it should make greater accessibility and give casting directors an opportunity to see faces that they wouldn't otherwise. Um, so that's my hope for it. But I, I certainly do say to my students that, you know, your job is auditioning. The booking the gig, that's the bonus. But your job is to audition and to audition well and to build those relationships with casting directors so that they can know you and trust you and bring you in. So, you know, if you get one, great. But then just go and do the work and do the next one and the next one and the next one. Love mm -hmm. it. And Greg, Greg do, you have a, do you have a closing comment uh, along that line as well then? I'll just pick up on what Tiffany said about sort of opportunities from sort of, you know, markets that aren't kind of Sydney and Melbourne, which are the main two markets. Uh, certainly it comes out, you know, because if you don't get the self-taping experience, you have you don't come over well in that forum. The other thing is, is if you're going for sort of a supporting role, the problem with a supporting role is it might have sort of, you know, six or eight days through a series or a film. But unless it's in one, in, in one section, that might be three or four different flights and accommodation. Mm -hmm. So there's a, that puts a lot of pressure on the production. I'm forever trying to sort of identifying in the script the character that might have three great scenes, but they're all in the same location. So mm. I know they're going to be shot out in a day or two and you can bring, and, and therefore I can look at people from all around the country or New Zealand because of the fact that I, I know they're going to come in and go out and mm. the kind of the cost of the kind of the accommodation airfares is negligible compared mm. to casting a local. But it's mm. when they've got three or four days across a kind of a four or five week, week period, that's when it becomes a problem. That's awesome. really useful insight, actually. Thanks, Greg. Because even for, you know, for people here and for students and for locally based people to talk to their agents and go like, work on our side to do the same thing and identify the ones where, you know, really quick pitch us for that one that maybe they just fly us in for those three days. That's, mm. that's a great insight. Thank you. And dare that's I say, right. if you're in Adelaide, you better have a great relationship with Ange because, you know, she's she's normally the kind of the link to the Ange, kind of... Ange, the, yeah, oh, yeah. I love Ange. Yeah, yeah, yes. she's yeah. great. Well, of course, but that's what I'm saying. It's kind of, you know, it's it's about yeah. sort of you know, finding the in. That's right. That's exactly right. That's the hardest thing. Well, mm. thank you very much, guys. Um, this has Pleasure been absolutely done. fantastic. Uh, the technical glitches aside, which is the joys, um, maybe AI will fix that up in the future. Um, thank you very much, Jeff, um, coming in from LA. It's been a pleasure to see you again. I'm over there in January, so I'll make sure I chase you up and get a ride in your car, hopefully. So I'll, 
Well, hopefully I'll I won't be here because tell. I'm on the I'm on the hook right now. Uh, if things go according to plan, um, I'm going back to and I'll be doing a Broadway show, and I'm supposed to find out any moment. So I will hopefully not be here to see you, David. Oh, well, fingers <laughs> crossed for that. Star, then. That's the movie fantastic. star, you know, I originated a role last two years ago there that was a big hit. And then they told me they had to give it that part to a movie star. And apparently the movie star turned them down. So now they're calling me and saying, would you still be interested? And I said, yes, of course. So hopefully wow. I'll be oh. leaving here in a few weeks and, uh, and I'll miss you again. But uh, Unless I'm in New York for Christmas. So maybe you never know. We started oh, in New I'll York. You, and we're, uh, we're listen, I plan on seeing you there. Let's do that Beautiful. instead. Love it. Let's get that. Thank you very going. much. Right. Greg, thank you. absolutely pleasure to see you again. Tiffany, thank you very much. I, I, I know Great you were on last month. It was great. great. Yeah, Thanks, okay. guys. All right. Nice to see you. See you Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.